Thank you very much, Mike. Um, that was really interesting and really um, good to see the arguments being presented. Thanks. So um, I'd like to um, ask Professor uh, Rebecca Fitzgerald to um, provide a response, please. And in the meantime, there are a few questions coming through on the um, Q&A, but please do keep those coming and we'll um, get to as many of those as we can. But in the meantime, um, over to you, please, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you, Mike, for a really thought provoking talk. Um, it's quite sobering, some of those statistics. Um, I don't think any of us would try and deny those anymore. I mean, I think we have woken up um, and, and I think we would take those as the true reflection of the situation. And I see it as a bit of a call to arms, really. And I, and I like some of your anecdotes along the way where, you know, perseverance pays off. <laughs> and uh, even for you, sometimes it wasn't easy to, to get things published and to get the attention of the funders and the opinion leaders, but you persevered. Um, and this did lead to some very important commissioned work and reports. And I think it's really behest to all of us to, you know, either through our local practice and where we can have effect and influence or, you know, on a wider or national scale, but it is up to all of us to try and do what we can to try and narrow this gap and improve the situation. So um, thank you for that. I feel very, um, you know, more motivated than ever <laughs> this is extremely uh important um but what i wanted to if, if i could just uh I just square my share my screen for a minute what i wanted to just um just to ask you about and to focus in on for one minute is about um this question of diagnostic tests because i think you know i absolutely agree that 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 is a big part of this problem. And I guess the question for me is, you know, is it about doing lots more or doing it differently? Um, and, and perhaps COVID has, has really focused the mind on this more than ever before. And in your um, report on screening, one of the big messages from that is about our need to target screening more. And I, I think we could extend that argument to our diagnostics as well to think about, you know, is it just about doing a lot more or really thinking about who we test or how we understand the people at highest risk um, and or use more tri triaging tests to actually, you know, increase the pool and test a much bigger pool of people in a simpler way to then direct our efforts on some of the, the other services. Because I think it's absolutely true that, you know, our services um, have been struggling to cope. And of course, we could just put a lot more money in and expand our number of scanners and endoscopists, and we could do more and more and more in the hope that then we're going to get it right and, and close the gap. Or we could uh, take some different views, because I think certainly talking to endoscopists, if I might just use that as an example, because that's, I guess, what I know most about, but talking to colleagues in British Society of Gastroenterology one of the reactions I've had to, to the COVID is, is how, of course, it's a, it's a desperate situation and we've turned off endoscopy and, and no doubt we, that will mean that we have missed diagnoses. But do we want to go back to a situation where we've just got waiting rooms stuffed full of patients and a huge backlog of endoscopy to get through? And yet at the end of the endoscopy list, most of those procedures are normal. And we, we you know, we somehow We've done a lot of procedures, but we haven't targeted it right at the people that perhaps need those tests the most. So I think that's an important question for us to really consider is, you know, how do we get to those in greatest need? Can we can we use COVID as a bit of an opportunity to think, you know, we've embraced a new technology, we're more digital than ever before. Perhaps we can um, use AI to help with some of our pathology backlog, our reading of scans. Can we think about new technologies to triage? We can alter thresholds, as you mentioned, for fit. So we can use these in slightly different contexts for screening and symptomatic testing um, so that we really try and, and reach those who need it most. So I, I guess I'd be interested on your reaction to that. Um, you know, are we testing 
is it just we're doing too little and we need to do more or do we need to do it differently and uh, how do we do that uh, and you mentioned one-stop shops you know uh, how do we make it easy for people um, I, I have to say although th just despite my all, all my work in this area I'm, I'm a kind of very reluctant visitor of the GP and a reluctant visitor of taking up screening tests and so on partly because it's inconvenient and um, I get different invitations for different tests at different places in different times and life feels too short so you know we have to think of the practicalities and the logistics as well so um those are some of my thoughts but thank you so much mike for um a terrific talk and i don't want to take up too much time because i'd love to hear the questions from the audience thank you thank you very much rebecca I mean, mike would you like to is there anything in Re rebecca that you'd like to take a minute just to briefly come back on at all yeah, yeah sure um I, I agree with you, Rebecca. I agree with you throughout, actually. Uh, yes, I think the call to arms is there, and we have now woken up. Um, and that's pretty widespread, which is great. Your question about do we do more or differently is a really important one. I have to say, my answer to that is, is both. Uh, there are some areas where we need to do, just do more. We are really hesitant to do these tests uh, you know we know that other countries are doing better than us why don't we do what the other countries do is part of it and i realize that we haven't got enough staff and so we need to think about the endoscopy staff the endoscopy facilities we also know we're actually not necessarily using our en existing endoscopy facilities as well as we could there's quite a lot of evidence emerging on that but i think the differently please give us new triage tests. That's really important. Um, and the FIT test is an example. I hope cytosponge will become a, a, another one. I think we also need to really question, this is a bit get, getting out, our model. We were taught, at least I was at my age, it's you take a clinical history, you do an examination, and then you investigate. Um, but then I've been asking people recently, how often do you actually do the examination step of that? Um, and I was talking to a gastroenterologist yesterday, and he said, I don't. Um, and so if he's doing it just on history, deciding who needs an endoscopy, can that not be done through triage and going straight to the endoscopy, clearing up you know, the people out of the outpatient clinics and, and therefore giving more access to the test when they need to be done? So my answer is it's more or different, more and differently. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a few um, interesting questions in the uh, in the Q and A. I'll just um, just flag a few. So a few people have been asking. I think, but um, based on the very um, interesting and quite telling bar charts that you showed about the um, about the the availability of kind of diagnostic techniques. And so, um, what do you think are the main issues there? How did that come about? And in particular, is there an issue to do with, for example? Um, um, staffing as well as the availability of kind of scanners and and, 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 and other machines? Answer, it's both. It, it, uh, the, the scanners is just the easier one to demonstrate, to be honest, um, because different countries use different staffing uh, arrangements, but they can all count a scanner. Um, so undoubtedly, we do need more scanning capacity. And at the very least, we surely need to get up to the average of for the OECD. I'm not I'm not saying we want to be right at the top end, because I think we can then do the more dif the differently part. Um, but it will take um, more machines and more staff. And we have now set up a diagnostics workforce board uh, that is looking at this. I think we need to look at international recruitment, getting people to come back um, who've retired. We need we need to look at skill mix as a whole. I mean, I could go on for hours on that, but I probably won't. Um, but it's a hugely important issue. OK, thank you. And then a, a few people are also asking about the role of um, genetic uh, testing uh, in, in early diagnosis and polygenic risk scores, et cetera, there's a lot we have for some screening programs. Just wondered any kind of reflections about um, how that's going to, might be used moving forwards? I think polygenic risk scores will be helpful um, for those that don't know about them, and I can't claim I'm an expert, um, but we know that there are one or two genes that, you know, if you've got that individual gene, you've got a very high risk. BRCA1, BRCA2 are very obvious examples for um, breast cancer. But we're also finding that there are myriad other genes which, if taken together, actually do show that you've got 
an elevated risk in the same level of risk uh, as the um, BRCA1 and BRCA2. I just take breast cancer as an example. Now, if we can do that on polygenic restore, why would we not screen them? They, uh, uh, you know, the logic is that they are at high risk and their risk starts at an earlier age um, than the average. So uh, let, us, let us do that. The really interesting question is, will we ever get to a point where people are so, so low risk on polygenic risk score that we say to them, you don't really need to come for screening? I think that's a more difficult question. Um, but I am pleased to say that I had a nice graphic of polygenic risk scores in my cancer screening um, report. So, so yes, I was con convinced. It's not the whole answer. But it's going to be an answer. It, it, it's going to help us identify people who ought to start screening earlier or have screening by different modalities. Hmm. Can't, I can't hear. Sorry, so thank you. Um, another um, um, point that a few of our um, attendees have made is about the role of primary care and particularly the role of uh, GPs. How so uh, as one person has put it, GPs might often feel between a rock and a hard place between um, whether to refer or not, don't want to kind of uh, don't want to miss cases, but also feel worried about um, uh, yep. uh, an over referring, if you like. So any thoughts on how to get around that conundrum? Um, absolutely. Uh, it, it is. A, it, it, I understand um, from a GP perspective how difficult this is. My father was a GP, my brother's a GP. I'd, I've been lectured about general practice all my life, um, and uh, quite rightly. I, I think one of the things was that until uh, this century, we didn't have any good primary care research on cancer. Um, and now uh, we do. Um, we've got some very good um, um, people, uh, Willie Hamilton in Exeter, Fiona Walters in Cambridge, others. You know, that it's now a field of interest. And I think that. Uh, and that's led to the guidelines, um, uh, which are now, at least they are evidence-based, which they weren't before. And I think that is really important in driving changes of behaviour. OK, thank you. Um, so then uh, uh, one, so maybe some more kind of patient focused questions. So what do you think about um, patient experience and the reported outcomes research while thinking about the kind of initiatives you're talking about and the, and the role of the patient and ex their experiences? Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, very pleased that we were able to set up a patient experience survey way back. Actually, I, I'm not going to take credit for that myself, although it came in during my time. Interestingly, the, the, the influence there came from Frank Dobson, who was the health secretary. He said, I want to know and I want a big enough survey so that you can really tell the difference between hospital A and hospital B. Um, and we had surveys which typically... Um, had 70,000 respondents. Um, and I think that gives us a good picture. One of the things that we could ask them, and we did ask them, is, you know, how long did it did you have symptoms? But also, how often did you go to the GP? Now, again, I'm not saying it's easy at the, at the GP stage, but when you when you get people saying we went, I went five or more times, you have to think, surely those ones, the, the threshold should be lowered. Um, and um, so again, patient experience is helping us to, to drive what we think clinical practice should look like. Mm. Okay, and, and you seem to, um, uh, you're mentioning in terms of um, increasing public awareness that that seems to be a tricky kind of nut to crack. Any thoughts about, in terms of increasing uptake of screening, et cetera, any kind of thoughts about what to do? Use of, so for example, people have talked about maybe using social media or, or other approaches. Social media, there are a number of different social media experiments, if you like, short, uh, uh, that have been done, which have been highly successful. Um, and again, um, I quoted one or two of those in uh, my report on screening. Uh, and I, I think we do need uh, to, to use that more. I think peer pressure is a very important one. So I think there's the social media. There's also, particularly for some um, minority ethnic groups, it's really explaining the process in detail. And another um, example I gave in my report was what had happened in a practice in the East End of London, actually just demonstrating what the bowel screening program meant and how you could collect a, a sample of feces in a clean way and uh, <clears throat> you know giving people 
the, the gloves to wear and saying that you can use an old margarine pot or whatever to collect it before you then send it back. You know, things like that. Um, I, if you do that, again, at local level, those things have shown impact. And using text reminders. Text reminders, um, there's a strong evidence base that th those work. For okay. Thank you. And then, so we'll follow on point, a question that was raised, which really um, charmed with the point that Rebecca made in her response about, um, about considering consideration of the harms of screening and the extent to which they're, um, they're um, covered. Um, I just wondered about, about the information around those. Do you think more can be done? Sorry, can you come again on that one? I, I, I missed it. Oh, sorry, just that um, a, a couple of people made the observation about how do you how do you kind of address the, the harms, the potential harms associated with screening when informing the public? Oh, um, so about, uh, oh, I think it was about 2012, uh, may have been 2010, um, we did a very large review of breast screening. It's interesting with Bowel screening, I think all the studies point in the same direction and, and there's, nobody really seems to be against it in principle. Um, cervical screening saves lives by preventing cancer. You pick it up before it's a cancer uh, and all the evidence is very strong there. The one that invokes an awful lot of media attention and attention in medical journals is breast screening. Um, and so... Um, along with um, Cancer Research UK, we commissioned Michael Marmot, who I think is beyond reproach in terms of doing this sort of work. And he came in and looked at all the evidence. He came to the conclusion, yes, uh, <clears throat> breast screening does save lives, but it also leads to some people being diagnosed with cancer that would not have caused problems in their lifetime. And we then engaged with Professor David Spiegelhalter um, in Cambridge, um, who, helped us a lot on how this evidence could be best presented and probably people listening into this program will know David Spiegelhalter better now than ever before uh, because of what he's been saying about presenting the evidence on on Covid. Um, so we did our very best to present this in a fair way and the information booklets are, still do that. We still get critics. Okay, thank you. Um, so a couple of people have asked questions about um, the um, national screening programs and the kind of the infrastructure around that so one question was about how can we which can be how can we overcome some of the bure bureaucratic barriers in the UK to advancing new early te uh, detection technologies so the NSC taking a long time to implement um, things and then there's another question about um, the introduction of new screening programs for less common cancers and how they how they that might be brought about yeah uh, national screening programs I I I do think that uh, although the National Screening Committee historically has done a very good job, it has become a bit static, let's call it that, so I don't know who's on this call, um, and, and um, I, I think the most obvious example of that is that they have always said we will only look at something if it covers the whole population, uh, maybe a, an age segment of the population, so they've been really unwilling to look at something like lung cancer screening because it would actually only apply to smokers and ex-smokers uh, because they're the only ones with high enough risk and probably to make this a cost-effective uh, <clears throat> program. I think they are changing their minds about that. There is also work going on, as I think, out, out of the report I wrote a year ago, saying how, how can these um, the evidence be best be reviewed how can it best be presented to ministers? Because th these are expensive programmes, and so they do require ministerial support. And I think the chief medical officer has a, a role there. And I realise he's quite busy at the moment, um, but when he stops being quite so busy, he, he's absolutely signed up on this. So I think we can do that. Less common cancers give us the evidence of benefit and I will fight hard to get screening programs in for those so when there is a test a good test that picks up the cancers at an early enough stage yes why not okay thank so, you and then um, if you... I was just going to say you know who knows we may get there with cytosponge yeah <laughs> indeed yes um, a few people have asked questions about kind of um, sort of inequalities in screening to how certain groups um, for example, um, um, inequalities by um, protected characteristics like sexual orientation um, and, and about how um, and, and, 
and so more and, and general and, and comments about the kind of inverse care law um which um uh, related to kind of up, uptake of screening so any observations about kind of increasing uptake and some of the problems with inequalities in the screening programs well unfortunately at the time when uh, public health england and nhs england were being set up um actually the funding at, at a local level for public health was cut um and I think the directors of the public health that, that still there, but they just don't have the teams with them. Uh, very difficult to actually get a figure on how, how big the cut was, but everybody told me it was it was big. So they are the people. I mean, we're hearing the same with test and trace now. It needs to be done at a local level. Um, and and so I think the cuts to public health that resulted from 2012 and all of that um, are you know, have hindered our attempts to reduce inequalities. There are some specific ones. Um, I think actually the transgender one is is a is a really uh, important one but, and interesting. I mean, you know, if somebody has uh, trans transitioned to being uh, a man, but they may still have a cervix, how are we going to make sure that they still get the invitations for cervical screening? Um, and um, <clears throat> and one solution to that is on the national records and the GP records to have two columns, one for biological sex and one for current gender. Um, so there are all sorts of things that can be done there. Mm. OK, thank you. Um, so there was so some questions about um, um, so questions about in terms of so we focused a lot on screening and early diagnosis. And clearly that's important. So one question is about um, about treatment as well and, 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 and access to treatment and the limits on um, um, people getting access to optimal treatment once they're diagnosed. Any kind of thoughts or comments about the problems there? Uh, I, very clearly very important. There's no, no point just diagnosing people if you don't then treat them. Um, uh, I think I, I indicated in my talk that surgery is still extremely important as, as a treatment for, for cancer. So picking up people at a point where they are st still have operable disease really matters. Well, that's the early diagnosis. I think our treatment services have improved a lot. We 20 years ago, we had a lot of treatments, even quite complex treatments, um, es esophagogastric surgery being done in almost every district general hospital in the country. And there is evidence that those hospitals that were doing smaller numbers do have less good outcomes. Um, that was quite a, a difficult, oh, I think I've disappeared. Um, no, uh, you're still here. You're still there. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, uh, anyway, they, uh, we, we did a lot to ensure that um, people who um, uh, were treated in major centres, we may need to go further on that. I'm, I'm not saying that's enough in itself. Um, radiotherapy, again, we have underinvested in radiotherapy, the same as we have in diagnostics. Um, that's getting better, but it's a, it requires a hard push all the time because um, it's, it's a very good treatment. Chemotherapy and other treatments, again, I think um, pay tribute to what NICE has done, that in the old days they used to be far too slow and I used to rail with them about that, but actually their processes have improved enormously. Um, and I think it is absolutely right that we should look and see what, what the evidence is that these treatments are effective and that they are cost effective. Um, so I, I think... I'm not hearing the same level of noise and concern as I was 10 years ago. Uh, that doesn't mean we get every treatment in quickly, but you know, the, the problems we had going back 15 years to getting Herceptin in, um, I, I, look, I think now you know, we have moved on from that. Okay, thank you. So we've got time for maybe one, or I'm just gonna pick one or two more questions we don't we've only got another a minute or two left so there was a quick um you, you mentioned covid in your in your talk and so um and, and related to primary care so someone's asked about whether you think the kind of move towards the the um uh kind of remote consultations for example in primary care and new ways of working in primary care what whether that might have any impact on kind of early detection of cancer and screening 
the, the move to virtual consultation, which were mostly telephone conversations in primary care, um, uh, was enormous and very rapid. Um, I think we now need to learn what aspects of that really worked and what when when does a clinician really need to see a patient? Um, and I think that is a field for research uh, that for the future. And I hope the uh, NIHR will fund that sort of research uh, but, uh, or, or others, I don't mind who does, does it, but it, I think it is a very important topic. To, so just saying we can all go over to virtual consultations all the time, I think is a bit risky um, because there are things... Even, even if you don't fully examine a patient, if you see a patient come into your consulting room and they are, you can see that they've lost weight, you can see how tired they are and exhausted they are, maybe even that they're jaundiced, whatever it may be, you can see those things um, in a way that may be much more difficult to do either by telephone or even by this sort of virtual consultation. Mm. OK, thank you very much. So um, we still have lots of open questions, but unfortunately we've uh, run out of time. So I think I need to draw this session to a close. And apologies if we didn't get around to asking all of your questions. We try to keep it as varied as possible, but, but thank you all. So, um, Mike, is there any final reflection you would like to make before we call it a day? Anything you'd like to say? I said at the beginning, uh, I, I really wasn't going to answer the question of how long will this take? but I think we need to have a big push on it now. And let's, let's use the NHS long-term plan commitment of getting to earlier diagnosis by 2028. I think we can do a lot, whether we will reach 75%, I somewhat doubt, but let's make a major push on that. It really does matter. Mm. That's a, a great note to end on. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, so well, well, so 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 just finally some thank yous. So thank you very much to uh, all our attendees for um, paying close attention and for all your interesting questions. Thank you very much to Rebecca for your uh, uh, in interesting response, but mainly thank you very much to you, Mike, for your for your time and for your very thought provoking talk today. Thank you very much indeed. Um, have a nice um, rest of the day, everybody. Um, I'm sorry that this year we can't now adjourn for uh, wine and nibbles, but uh, maybe next year uh, that's something that we can do. So thank you all very much and have a, a lovely afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Cheerio. Thank you.